welcome everyone and we're very glad to be with you. We're joining you from storm swept Atlanta, but fortunately Devonshu and I both had power and running water and internet and all those good things. Um, my name is Emily Porter. I'm the repository program manager um, for our new Samvera based repository here at the Emory University Libraries. And I am joined by Devanchu Matlawala, who is representing our software engineering team. And today we're going to talk a bit about our experiences building a second generation repository using Samvera components. Uh, this includes our approach to defining and managing preservation entities. Um, we'll talk about our implementation goals and some specific uh, examples and challenges that we've worked through. And uh, we have probably a little more material than time. Um, if we do have time, we'd like to talk about some of our other preservation surface components and um, some self-assessment activities that we've done. And I also want to note, I realize not all of you may have these kinds of use cases that you're looking at, um, but we hope that you'll still find this interesting and informative. So before we began, uh, we began development on our next generation repository, um, we had a very lengthy requirements gathering process. Um, we had a digital preservation requirements working group that reviewed a number of very large and well-established standards. Um, I don't have time to talk about all of those, but I, I would mention some key references are the OIAS model, premise metadata standard, uh, Portland common data model, Library of Congress preservation event types, and also um, while we were going through this requirements activity, the libraries also implemented their first comprehensive preservation uh, policy, which in and of itself was a pretty big deliverable for us. Um, previously, a lot of our preservation activities were kind of happening in silos across the organization. Um, so looking at our actual implementation goals, uh, one was to really actualize and, and realize that preservation policy and, and put it into practice and into code. Um, building our locally defined archival information package structure, so what digital objects for preservation would look like and how they're structured. Uh, leveraging existing Fedora 4 capabilities, working within our institution's AWS and S3 capabilities. And these last two points are, are really critical, I think, um, for Hyrax specifically, was being able to provide a human-readable audit trail of significant activities that are occurring on our assets and to manage as many preservation activities as possible through a hyrax based uh, interface. So here's a, a quick overview of our local infrastructure. Um, we're hosted in an Emory University managed AWS environment. Um, and I point that out just because not all of the full service catalog from AWS is available for us to use. So in some cases we had to get a little creative. Um, starting from the top here, uh, we have a, a blacklight discovery and access interface. Um, won't really be talking about that today. Um, we also have a Hyrax 3 based application, um, which I am very sorry uh, and send my apologies and compliments to Notre Dame. We didn't mean to uh, steal your product name. We have been referring to this as our library staff curation and management application, and it, it kind of just got whittled down to DLP curate. Um, we use Solar Cloud for indexing, um, Fedora 4 as our sort of uh, system of record for preservation metadata. We don't store our binaries in Fedora 4, but instead um, push them through into S3. And I'll talk a little bit about our storage later on. So one of the first things we did was to really look at our preservation data model. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with Hyrax and PCDM. This should look fairly uh, familiar to you. However, we've had to make some additions to this. Um, so we have a single generic work type and a comprehensive metadata profile uh, at the work level. Um, works contain descriptive rights and administrative metadata, and they also can uh, hold these child entities for preservation workflows and for events. Um, and we'll talk about each of those in more detail. Uh, at the file set level, file sets um, perform the typical Hyrax function. They have a little bit of descriptive metadata. Um, we've expanded on that slightly. Um, and then they also can contain uh, event objects. And then within the file set, we have expanded on the number and types of files that a file set can contain. Um, so that includes a preservation main file, 
um, as well as intermediate service extracted text and transcript. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about this in detail. Um, so in looking at our file set extensions, before I go any further, I do want to call out some harmful language. Um, the phrase preservation master file. Um, unfortunately, this is a, a fairly well established uh, term in the preservation community. And I would love to talk to others of you who are in that community or other communities um, to see if we can find a better term. Um, but you will see that in our code and in our interface, unfortunately, and I do apologize for that. Um, some of this nomenclature is coming from the PCDM use extension. Um, if you aren't familiar with that, um, there's a link there. Um, at the file set level, we also uh, provide support for primary and supplemental content. So uh, some file sets are intended for users to interact with and others are more serving just purely a preservation purpose. Um, and then we do extract a couple of additional technical metadata fields from FITS beyond um, kind of what's standard for Hyrax. And at the right side of my screen, uh, I am showing an example of a book object file set. Um, we've really heavily customized the view file set page, um, but you can see um, all the populated uh, files for this particular file set includes a, a TIFF and an OCR file and also a plain text output. Um, and we've also added a couple of utilities here to run fixity checking on demand. Um, we'll talk more about fixity checking later if we have time. Um, we also have some utilities to regenerate the thumbnail as well as recharacterize a file set. And then we display all the available technical metadata there for the set. Um, in terms of how file sets are created, we have two methods. Um, one is a bulk import process using CSV files, um, which DCE developed for us. Uh, at the top of my screen, hopefully you can see um, there is one row for a work. And then there are additional rows for each file set. And that provides that kind of file context mapping within the file set. And then these are all uh, related back to each other by use of a deduplication key, um, which we determine kind of for each work and, and relative to a collection. Um, and then we also have um, modified our edit work form. Uh, so the files tab there has been uh, replaced with our own form that allows users to supply um, that main preservation file, as well as any uh, additional derivatives. Oh, sorry. And now I'm going to hand it over to Devonshu to talk a little bit about some of the implementation in code. Thanks, Emily. Uh, so to make this possible, we had to make some changes to uh, Hyrax, uh, basic Hyrax out of the box. Uh, some code changes uh, that we made were around uh, the ingest jobs, like the attach files to work job, and also the database schema. Uh, we, we had to add uh, uh, columns to a database table uh, to be able to save the additional files that we wanted to save in a file set. So uh, basically uh, with Hyrax out of the box, uh, we get three files for file set. One is the original file, then the thumbnail and the extracted text. The thumbnail and the extracted text are created during the create derivative job. Uh, in our curate application, we needed uh, those three plus uh, five additional files per file set. Uh, here uh, we have uh, our own extracted text that we use. We have a custom predicate for that. And uh, that gives us the ability to upload our own uh, extracted text uh, in case of books. And we all, we, so we also switched off uh, the uh, automated extraction, uh, text extraction that happens uh, via Hyrax. Um, uh, also, we made some changes in the file actor, the ingest file method. Uh, we were making sure that during characterization, when we run or queue up the characterized job, we make sure that we only queue it up for the preservation master file and none of the other files in the file set. Um, so just checking when the file is ingested, if it's the preservation master file, then you queue up the characterized job. Uh, to also, uh, we had this uh, logic in place that when we were creating derivatives, in our case, only thumbnail, uh, we were making sure that we create a thumbnail for a preferred file uh, that uh, logic that we had, which was basically if the service file is present, then uh, you create a thumbnail for the service file. And if, uh, if not the intermediate file, and finally, if none of those are present, then the preservation master file, which is a required file in the file set. 
uh, we also use this logic to uh, display the file or the image in the universal viewer display. And uh, we used uh, the preferred file logic to make sure that the correct image URL is going into the IIIF manifest, uh, which finally is being used by UV. Uh, there's more, there's a lot of changes that we have made to the curate ingest process, uh, to the Hyrax ingest process in curate, and we have linked uh, our changes. We have made a documentation, and the documentation is linked on this on the slide. Thanks, Devanshu. Uh, so next, we're going to talk about those preservation event entities. And we define those as um, primarily automated system actions that occur to some type of larger workflow. And each of these actions are captured in a human readable event entry. Um, so the events that we're supporting in our first version um, at the work level include policy assignment. And this is where we record the initial visibility that was assigned at the time of ingest. Validation uh, provides information about the ingest into Fedora for the work and that all the required components were supplied. And we also have a generic modification event that just kind of tracks basic information about when a work was modified after ingest. And at the file set level, we're tracking a number of events, including virus scanning, uh, characterization, uh, which includes a number of actions that FITS performs, message digest calculation, in which we calculate one or more checksums, uh, depending on the file, file submission, and, and that's recording uh, when the file was submitted out to preservation storage, and also fixity checking. So here's kind of a view of, um, this is also part of our view file set page. Uh, this is an example of the events that we're recording for a file set. Um, we have used a local namespace to define these, um, but you will probably see some similarities, kind of premise-ish, but not really. Um, in, in the example of a fixity check event, uh, you can see the name of the event, the start and end, the outcome, whether it was success or failure. Um, and then we have event-specific detail, in this case, the individual file that was checked and which checksum was being um, verified. Um, we also capture the initiating user, um, and you can see my little sarcastic name tag there. Hello, my name is Bypass Admin. Um, we had to do a bit of work to actually detect and record who the uh, who or what the user was who initiated the process. Um, so we're glad to have that working. If you look at these things in Fedora, a lot of times it just comes through as this kind of generic Bypass Admin user, um, and then we also record the name and version of the um, application that was performing the task. Um, and I'll hand it back over to Devanshu. Um, thanks, Emily. Uh, talking about uh, the implementation details of, uh, of preservation events, we had to split out events. Some were being saved on the work while some were being saved on the file sets and some on the files. Uh, so for the work events, uh, when, the, when a work is saved, we would uh, create an event like validation or policy assignment once the work is created and save those events on the work at the work level. Uh, some events like the file set events were, uh, that Emily mentioned before were something like file submission. So when a file is submitted or ingested, uh, we check if the file was saved correctly or successfully. And then according, accordingly, we have a success or failure event. Uh, some of the uh, some of the file set events were saved uh, uh, on the file set level, meaning for the only for the preservation master file for something like characterization. Like I mentioned before, we only characterize the preservation master file, and message digest calculation only happens on the preservation master file. So those are saved only once at the file set level. But something like a file submission or a fixity check that happens for every file in the file set. So those are more in number as compared to. Uh, uh, characterization uh, in terms of uh, on a file set. Uh, these uh, preservation events are uh, implemented as nested objects in Fedora. A preservation event has its own model class in code, uh, and we uh, use nested attributes on the work and uh, file set models uh, to be able to implement preservation events in those places. Uh, these uh, events are also indexed in Solar for display purposes. Uh, so that we can retrieve uh, index data quickly and show them on the work uh, show page and the file set show page. 
uh, there's more documentation on preservation events again in our GitHub and which is linked over here on the slide and hopefully uh, when these slides are shared, uh, everyone can take a look. Thanks, Devanshu. Uh, so next we'll talk about uh, preservation workflow entities. And we define these as um, much more human managed, but also human readable context for major digital object lifecycle phases, um, and particularly including any associated rights determinations. Um, so some examples of these would be, would be accession. Um, and this is really largely upstream of the repository, but it is information that's very important for the long-term um, custody of the item. So why did we decide to digitize or make a copy or preserve the item? Uh, ingest, so circumstances around the actual ingest, particularly if it was a migration type situation. Um, versioning, I have an asterisk here because we still have a lot of work to do on versioning, um, but that's something that we hope to address later. Decommissioning, um, circumstances of if we had to remove or reduce access to material, and deletion. Um, and I wanted to note also that our preservation policy, really, uh, we don't delete. Um, except under very rare circumstances. Uh, so that's another aspect of the Hyrex user interface that we've had to do a lot of work on was to suppress those very readily available red delete buttons um, and only allow uh, certain administrative users to do that. Um, so our workflow metadata, uh, this again is defined in a local namespace. Um, we record the name of the workflow, um, some general notes about the workflow, and then we have a number of uh, kind of rights related information for that determination or for that um, life cycle event. And you can see on the right here is an example of an object from our repository um, that has quite a bit of this populated. Um, there's some information about the original donning, uh, uh, donor and um, also the ingest. So kind of this is a public domain object. So we've recorded that uh, rel relative to those determinations. And then this object was actually slated for decommission. Uh, so the physical object is not necessarily going to be um, provided anymore. And therefore the library administration requested that we um, suppress display of that particular item. And I'll hand it back to you, Devanshu. Um, so the implementation for preservation workflow is similar to preservation events. Workflows are also nested objects, but they are only saved or uh, they're only saved as nested attributes uh, on the work model and not on file sets. Uh, like events, these are also indexed for in solar for display purposes. Uh, the preservation workflow metadata is loaded after the works are ingested. Uh, we have a rake task, which is linked on this uh, slide again. Uh, we have a rake task uh, that takes care of uh, uh, adding or importing that metadata to works. Uh, we, uh, like Emily mentioned, we really don't want to delete any of the uh, any of the metadata that we import. Uh, so these should only be populated once. And if there is a mistake, then uh, we make sure that we first delete the existing metadata and overwrite on uh, those attributes. Uh, like I said before, these are single value. These attributes are all single valued, and like you can see in the code, they're all multiple faults. Okay. Thanks, Devanshu. Uh, so next we'll talk a little bit about our storage backup and restoration, uh, which is obviously a critical piece to uh, preservation context. Um, for our content storage, we first transfer all material up to our AWS space uh, to an EFS volume, and we perform fixity checking during that file transfer process using our clone. The first copy of our ingested files is stored in S3 in the US East region, and then we've developed a custom process um, using an Ansible role to uh, identify only those newly added files um, in the first bucket and copy those over to a second bucket in the US West region for better um, geographic diversity. And that happens every 48 hours. Um, so I wanna mention just a couple of headaches. We really ran into some issues because when we first set this up, we had versioning enabled on our S3 bucket and found that that was really not compatible. Um, and we had to go through a couple of tries uh, to get that second copy process working the way we wanted. Um, so I want to thank Michael Klein and also Beth Sadler and DCE for helping us get through some of those uh, Fedora and S3 um, hiccups. Uh, in terms of backup and restoration, 
Um, given the kind of number of components and where all the data is in a Samfara solution, um, we kind of had to learn the best way to uh, identify and back up those various pieces. We did a large scale backup and restoration activity of uh, cloning our production data back to a test environment. Um, and that went really well. But one thing that we learned, um, we were surprised by is there's this very nice um, audit trail kind of that comes out of the box from Hyrax about uh, user activity on file sets. And we learned that that's actually stored in Redis. Uh, we didn't know that. So we learned that we had to back that up too in order to be able to keep that. So finally, I will talk about uh, fixity checking. Um, I know I'm sure we could spend an hour talking just about this, and I'm sure many of you have lots of stories uh, to share. We are using Fedora 4's fixity service. Uh, we're checking all the files in a file set using their SHA-1 values. Um, we do have that on-demand checking offering. Um, we also have a rake task that runs every two months, and that creates a queue of files that have not received a check within the last 90 days. Um, that's working so far, but the more files we have, we know that we're going to have to adjust this just in order for um, things to actually complete. So all of those outcomes are logged as preservation events. Um, we're also interested in this uh, serverless fixity service that AWS offers, but we really don't have a sense of how much, how much it will cost us to run that. So if anyone's using that, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, so some lessons learned. Um, in Hyrax, those notifications about failures are only sent to the original depositor. Um, so that's not terribly useful for us. Um, we want to get that more in an aggregated way. Um, we also had a recent experience with um, really learning a lesson about we sent way too many fixity checks uh, too quickly to S3, and we hit some kind of request threshold, which kind of caused this tidal wave of failures, unfortunately. Um, we also know that they are false failures, um, but we're going to have to kind of resolve that. Um, the way that we got that we kind of got past this issue was we rebuilt that rake task so that it's only running on a single queue, uh, fixity queue inside Kick with a single thread. So it checks checks one file at a time. So it runs more slowly, um, but we've had uh, virtually no failures uh, that way. Um, another thing, I, I guess that we have benefited from doing that fixity checking is in some cases, um, most recently we found about 30 file sets that for which one or more of the files didn't exist in S3. So because the file could not be retrieved through this process, um, we learned that it actually hadn't been adjusted so we can go back and fix those. Um, and then I'll just mention quickly uh, another aspect of um, our kind of preservation services that we want to do reporting to stakeholders and we manually compile uh, data from a number of sources to kind of produce this report. Um, some of this we can get from Hyrax, um, but because we have more files than you know the traditional file set expects, we created a new rake task that will count the number of works file sets and all the individual files on a per collection basis. So that's been really helpful. Um, we also pull certain metrics from AWS. Uh, we have a CloudWash uh, dashboard, and that lets us monitor the um, binary file counts and storage usage um, very easily. And then also for fixity checking, uh, we're reporting on failures. And again, we're kind of compiling that from what we hear from Hyrax, also if we have failed jobs in Sidekick. And then fortunately, because we have all these events indexed in Solar, it's much easier to uh, produce a report there. And then finally, um, just to wrap up, as we were nearing the end of development on this first leg of the journey, um, we decided to kind of take a minute and do a self-assessment. And um, there's a very helpful tool, um, the National Digital Stewardship Alignment uh, uh, <laughs> Alliance, I believe, uh, NDSA Level of Digital Preservation Assessment Tool. So we worked through that. Um, and largely, you know, we're doing fairly well. Um, there are some gaps that we're very aware of, um, and these are also planned features that we hope to develop in the future. One of which is making sure that we have three or more copies and are sending them out to preservation services or partners, um, including AP Trust. Um, we also need to come up with a mechanism for how to do fixity checking on all these additional copies because Hyrax and Fedora are not immediately aware that those exist. And then of course, we're very interested in doing more work on versioning um, both at the work level 
as well as at the file set level. Um, so unfortunately, the customizations we've made for file sets means that the Hyrex kind of versions option doesn't actually function for us right now. Um, and of course, we're very interested in um, utilizing OCFL and hopefully um, working with Fedora 6 in the future. So thank you all very much for your time. I wanna thank some of our local groups, uh, Digital Pre Preservation Requirements Group, our software engineering and middleware teams, um, DCE, both current and alumni, and many of you in Sambera who have helped us along the way uh, with consultations and also with sharing your code. Um, so here's a link to our DLP Curate repository uh, and also our program wiki, uh, which has a, a lot more information about some of the things I've been talking about today. And then of course, Devonchu and I uh, and many others of our team are on Slack and would love to talk to you more if we have time. Thank you, Emily and Devonchu, that was great. We have about four minutes for questions. And we have one question in the Q&A. How many works do you have in your repository and are you seeing any performance issues with these robust file sets and recording events? Yeah, we have, um, at the moment, we have about 13,000 works, uh, about 65,000 file sets and about 160,000 files. Um, but just for the first few collections we're doing, we're gonna hit a million files very quickly. Um, I would say we have not had so much problem about files and file sets so much as we've had the kind of known struggles around large community, uh, large collections and collection membership. Um, so we're still kind of working through that. I would say it's more at the, the work level than the file level. Excellent. Another question, did you consider using S3 cross-region replication policy instead of the custom Ansible role for copying to US West? Um, I think others on our team might be able to answer that better than me, but I think that's one of the reasons why we had versioning enabled in our S3 bucket, and that was causing conflicts with Fedora. Um, so someone else can probably um, address that in Slack. Yeah, Collins uh, mentioned, uh, addressed that in Slack. And I'll just repeat for the recording that Collins says that, yes, that requires ver versioning and versioning did not work well for us. Any other questions?